Hi, uh, my name is Chris Berg. I like to talk about Data Kitchen's technical architecture and uh, how to integrate parts of Data Kitchen into your infrastructure. So this uh, target of this is a, a more technical audience. Um, uh, we talk a little bit about what we do uh, from a functional standpoint um, in, in slides, and then we get into the architecture and how we integrate. So uh, Data Kitchen is a data ops platform, and that, that really is about helping teams release and deliver analytics faster than they've ever been able to before. And by analytics, we mean models or data engineering pipelines, et cetera. And so there's four main features in what we do. It's really about orchestrating these complex data pipelines, creating analytic environments, deploying new ideas into production, and automating tests and monitoring quality. Um, and so if you listen to our last uh, video about kind of the seven steps of data ops uh, from a best practices standpoint, we view part of we view analytics as a as a manufacturing line, and that there's a in any analytic process there's a bunch of tools that people use have settled on, and those tools fall into categories. Some tools process data, that may be ETL tools or data pipeline tools or scripts. And some uh, tools actually help run algorithms on data. R, Python, SAS, um, data robot, and some tools help visualize data, Tableau, uh, Looker, uh, a whole bunch of markets, and, and some do reporting, but each one of those are almost workstations that you can do, and each one are driven by code. And so uh, Data Kitchen is actually less, in some ways, less interested in the data and more interested in the tools and the code that actually drive the data processing, and think of it like a manufacturing line. Um, and the other part is, is we also think of analytics uh, for, like software development, and that we're actually helping you create a environment that you can do development in, and then run a bunch of tests that help you regress, make sure that you don't have any regressions or feature errors, and then deploy those into production. So beneath the um, beneath all this, we're managing a Git repository and creating branches. Uh, we're helping you build environments, so start up servers, shut down servers, running tests and monitoring production, doing the merge and deploy, managing a set of parameters and uh, vault credentials for you so that you can uh, be sure that you have the right login associated with each environment. And the, the trick here is that you, uh, we think the reason data ops exists and the market is uh, agreeing with us is that you know most CDOs and data and analytics teams have this problem is they just don't want to find out uh, from a production standpoint, they don't want to find that they've got errors in production or they're late. It's embarrassing. Else, you know, people don't believe the analytics. A lot of reasons. Um, and and uh, but at the same time, they also want to change their analytics based on feedback from the customers um, because our customers are demanding. So how do you do both those things? Um, how do you not have uh, learn about data quality issues and how do you not break production? And that's the goal of data ops. And to do that, we um, have our product, and it's got sort of four main conceptual buckets. Uh, we use food metaphors for it, so apologies for that. We've got something called a kitchen, which is a place to work, uh, recipes and tests, which are ways to uh, orchestrate or do workflow across all your tools, um, ingredients, which are reusable components, and then uh, orders, which are the metadata of resulting all that, uh, of running recipes and, and the test results on, on top of your tools and data. And so the first uh, part that you'll talk, that we talk about, is that we've got a kitchen and a kitchen is a place to work. And so you've got to build a kitchen, it's got an environment. And so a kitchen is a way that you can um, start up a set of servers, shut down a set of servers, assign a plot, a space in a server, um, invite people to work in that, um, create res or run, create or run recipes separately, uh, do a build, test, deploy cycle. Um, we're a big believer in variables and controls and parameters, and you can have those scoped to a kitchen. And also, we create a Git branch um, and help you merge from the kitchen. And we can link to your any agile process that you have. And so uh, you work in a kitchen, but you run recipes. And recipes are an abstraction of the whole analytic process. So you sort of plug in. Think of recipes as the thing you plug your tool into, your ETL tool, your data science tool, your visualization tool. And it does the job of transforming value uh, data into value, and it's really represented as a directed graph. Um, and it's a directed graph that's sort of decorated with a bunch of, of tests and monitors. And each node in that directed graph is a bunch of different types, um, some of which talk to Docker containers, some of which talk directly to databases, some of which execute Python code. And those graphs conceptually can be used for different things. One is actually to do the work, do the production work. 
Um, another one is just to do development. Um, you know, you may want to take part of a graph and, and or one node and, and, and change it. Um, the third is actually you can use these graphs to help um, in the product help create environments to do your work. So you can, we have uh, graphs and node types that start up servers, that shut down servers. Um, and then fourth, you can create graphs that actually do create deployment packages for you. Say I wanna um, have a running system and I wanna just change, add one table. And so the, the graphs themselves, the recipes, um, have a, a bunch of different duties uh, associated with them. And when you run a recipe, you create an order, and that order is stored in a, a Mongo database. The recipe itself um, comes from, if you look at the top slide here, it comes from Git. So it's stored in uh, GitHub Enterprise. And the Docker, and if it has Docker containers, those come from one or more Docker hubs. Um, but so when it's running, uh, it creates an order, which is actually a, an, a document in, in Mongo, a document already a database, and that stores the running results of the recipe, and that's what the recipe runs, what's the timing results, the test results, any metadata. It doesn't store data, it stores metadata about the run. Um, and so that allows you, because we keep track of those over time, that allows you to look at patterns and statistics of, of what happens with your data. And uh, finally, you can take um, chunks of recipes and share them. Um, and those are make create reusable components. And so think of it as a microservice or a reusable recipe, reusable shareable uh, recipe variation that you can have uh, one team kind of do their work and then another team do their work. And each of them have sort of subgraphs that they're working on um, that help them uh, work independently, but also have their work uh, put together. And that's a, we have a component model that you can do that. Um, and so that's really the, the pieces from a functional standpoint, uh, recipes, uh, kitchens, orders, and ingredients. So what's our architecture? So uh, you know, it's a modern architecture. We have a, 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 a UI where you can go in and, and do uh, basically anything to the recipe and run and see the results, uh, create kitchens. Uh, we have a command line interface where it pulls, you can take the recipe, it pulls it to your file system. You can edit the recipe with the file system um, on the file system and then, you know, push the changes, run recipe, see results. You can control the whole system from, uh, from the command line. And, and both those, the GUI and the CLI actually use a REST API that you can program against. So we, we try to be a good corporate citizen and allow you to, um, you know, script our system like you would script any other, any other system. And so from a technology standpoint, um, you know, if you, if one, idea is that each environment uh, is customers will have multiple environments. Sometimes they'll be on-prem, sometimes they'll be in the cloud, sometimes they're both. And so we, we allow you, we, we put an agent into each one of the uh, customer's environment and we have sort of a multi-tenant application that sits on top and then a bunch of supporting services. So our technology, all the data never leaves these virtual clouds or on-prem or no data's uh, going in and out, but we're kind of putting an agent in that, that does the execution on that. And if we drill in a little bit more what that looks like, there's uh, these supporting services on the left-hand side. So we use Auth0 for authentication. We can also use Okta. Auth0 has got a bunch of different single sign-on bindings that it can use. So if I come in through the, the UI, I hit an, an Nginx uh, web server, a DK app goes in and uh, authenticates it. And then when I look at a recipe, that recipe comes up from Git. And if I do any editing, the recipe uh, goes. If I then want to uh, see what my logins are to my databases, those are stored in Vault, which is a secure storage back, encrypted back by a, a database. And so when I hit run a recipe, it actually executes down here in DK modules. That talks to all your datas and all your lakes and servers, et cetera. Um, and uh, gets the information from uh, Git on the latest branch and then stores the results in uh, in Mongo and of course gets the authentication credentials from Vault. So no data leaves uh, your environment, it talks to your servers um, and then you can look at it through uh, the REST API, the UI, et cetera, to find out what's going on. And th these services can either live, uh, the Data Kitchen can have one of them or you can put them at your customer site. And uh, you see here, there's sort of a Mesos, a distributed application engine in about, a, uh, this is March, 2019. We're um, 
about adding support for Kubernetes and, and in fact running any kind of container engine down here instead of having us manage a container engine up, up on top. Um, and so you could have, you know, Kubernetes or Farsight or other con uh, sort of cluster container managers that you can run. And so this uh, architecture allows us to do nice things like uh, if you've got customers who have both AWS and Google Cloud and want to run together or on-prem. Uh, so this, it's a multi-agent architecture. So you can have multiple agents per customer or you can have a dev environment and a QA and a dev environment and a production environment that are completely separate. Um, so financial services companies like that. Um, so that's, that's our architecture. Um, and getting into, so if, uh, if I before I jump in, so a recipe is a is a graph. A graph it's a graph of nodes. Each one of those nodes execute here, but they're different types of nodes that do different things. And so when thinking about implementing our system, you have to think about how what nodes you're going to run and what kind of technologies you're going to you're going to use. And so uh, we have a bunch of different ways that these nodes can integrate. And so um, there's ways that we've, uh, and I've got a bunch of them on these slides. So the first one is we've got a type of node called an action node. And that directly sends code, for instance, SQL to a server. And it, the, the, it, the data processing happens in that server. So it runs and connects through ADBC, ODBC, JDBC, a bunch of different methods to run. And so, uh, and, uh, you know, if you're running against Redshift or BigQuery, this is the way that we're doing it. We're they're taking it or SQL Server, we're injecting the code and running against it. There's a type of node called a mapper node. And this is a case where you're getting data from somewhere and it could be S3, SFTP, even JDBC. You're bringing it into the process space of the uh, Docker node that runs. Um, and then you're doing some source and sync mapping and some simple unpacking and, and uh, zipping and then pushing it back. And so this is useful, like in a lot of cases, you wanna get something from an SFTP server, um, do some checks on it and then push it out to an S3 bucket as an example. Um, and these are built in. There's also a, a way you can do a mapper node, uh, which is a kind of a version of a Docker node. You could pull some data from somewhere. It's loaded up into a Docker, uh, any type of Docker container. So we've got some standard ones that do, for instance, Python processing. So you can do some Python processing in the middle and then push the result to somewhere else. Um, and so the, uh, it could be anything. You could load it into an ETL tool, do the processing. You could load it into a Jupyter Notebook, a data science notebook, et cetera. Um, and so these run, uh, if you look at on the left-hand side here, uh, in when we go and install something, into a customer site, there's this DK modules and app client. Both are installed in a Docker container here. And this, these Docker containers, when they run, they're executing um, these nodes. And in the case of when a Docker container creates another Docker container, it actually happens, uh, creates a, uh, a secondary Docker container that runs uh, and the data is loaded in and then the data out, comes out. So um, there's other type of nodes here. So um, there's a bunch of different ways that you can use a Docker node. So one case is a, it's a basically a virtual environment. So you create a Docker file, you put your tool in. So we have an example of this is a Pentaho node where we run Pentaho in the process space of the Docker container and it runs. And so this node runs, um, you can, it's got configuration, you can uh, run it uh, and treat it in some ways like a function, pour the, uh, into it goes the code that runs it, and out from it comes log file and test data information. And that happens with all these type of Docker nodes. We're trying to, we have a standard called an uh, analytic container standard that's up on GitHub and a bunch of example containers where you can run these uh, standard um, uh, type of tools that are reusable. Because that's one idea is we've got reusable containers that you can use over and over again, where you put code in, you run it, and you can put a different type of code in and run it. And then you can also create function specific containers that do, they're just one node and one recipe that is loaded from a Docker hub and they do something. And they're not useful in any other recipes or any other nodes. And this may be the case that you've got some unique code or unique processing that you wanna do. You don't wanna take the work to generalize it. Um, and you're just gonna run this Docker container. And so uh, we, we support that. Um, there's another way when you've got either a general purpose or a specific Docker container that the Docker node talks to a different server through uh, SSH. And we've got a built-in one with Ansible here that can actually go out and um, go to, uh, it can either 
uh, use Ansible, you can load an Ansible script in it, or we've got some simpler bindings where you can go and take and do WinRM or SSH and lay down a file on a server and run it. And so there's a lot of tools that have uh, command line APIs. And so if you have a tool like an ETL tool that has a command line API, we'll go in through this. We'll, we'll, you'll push, say, I want to run this workbook, this uh, Informatica workbook. It takes that workbook, pushes it onto the server, calls the command line, runs it, and gets log file, and then test data back out uh, to the node. And so this is one way, if you've got anything that's runnable by a command line that says, I want to run this job and this job or work is defined by some workbook xml binary whatever file you can then integrate that tool this way and it's a this is a very general purpose command line uh, way of doing it another way that we do uh integration in docker node is through a rest api and so some running servers have a rest api so for instance tableau online or tab tableau server has a rest api and then the and a, and a the container doesn't do the processing in it but it talks to the rest api to this tool server um, and then a, a fourth way we're using these Docker nodes is that we're actually using them to start and stop an external service. So you may have a server somewhere that you want to start up. Um, so for instance, in Amazon, you, we have case, cases where you want to start a Redshift server. And so we have uh, containers that are general purpose that they get, hey, go start this Redshift server. Um, and so this is a very uh, general purpose way to uh, for you to plug in anything into a Docker container and run it, uh, either run it as, uh, you know, just, hey, I'm just going to run this. It's either going to pass or fail or run it where you're pushing some code in, getting log and test data back out. Uh, and we have a standard for that. Um, and so that's it in terms of our, our technical architecture. It's a, a flexible open system. Um, we have a bunch of different ways that you can connect a bunch of standard types of um, integrations that already exist. Um, and it's pretty easy for us to both have types of integrations where if there's a database that we don't support, it takes us some time, uh, you know, a, a, uh, a week or two to, to certify and, and get it up running to to support it or if you've got a database that you want to support you can always go the docker route and, and just do these types of docker integrations so it's a very flexible uh, open way of for integrating uh, different tools um, and that's it thank you for your time uh, have a great day